If your pontoon boat needs a new cover, you could purchase one of those cookie cutter covers that seldom fit and never last long. Or you can hire a canvas shop and make a custom fitting cover which could cost you $1,200 to $1,400. But if you're handy and like to do things yourself, you could make a custom fitting pontoon boat cover for as little as $350. Bucks. This video will give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to make your own custom fitting pontoon boat cover yourself using supplies from Sailrite. Do it yourself and save. Angela from the Sailrite Loft is going to show us how it's done. The first step in making a pontoon boat cover is taking measurements to determine how much fabric is required. We will measure from the location where snaps will be installed along the edge of the boat, then to the center line of the boat with the support pole raised to the height we desired. Then measure from the position at the stern where snaps are installed to the bow. It is best to measure along the same plane as the support poles. We do not have all four in place, but notice that Angela is holding the tape measure up in an attempt to replicate them. The support poles are used to tent the boat cover, which will prevent water from collecting on the cover. Write those measurements down. We will also be adding extra length just to be sure we have enough fabric. Now take those measurements and use these equations to figure the length of each panel and the number of panels required. The extra 20% and 5% is used for a safety factor and the 4 inches is used for double hems all around the sides. Here are the figures for our 24 foot pontoon boat. We need 6 panels of fabric. Our fabric is 60 inches wide that are about 150 plus inches in length. That's a total of 25 yards of the fabric. Here Angela is using a straight edge T to mark the fabric to size. Then she uses scissors to cut it out. When each panel is cut, roll it up so the outside surfaces are being rolled in towards the center of the roll. Do this procedure until all the panels required for your pontoon boat cover are cut to size. For this pontoon boat, we made the cover out of Sherlass fabric. Sherlass fabric is an all-weather, 100% solution dyed polyester that offers great protection for anything outdoors. Sherlass was originally developed for the marine industry to endure the stress of boat covers. Sherlass fabric is a tough, non-abrasive polyester fabric with excellent weather and abrasion resistance and good breathability, making it the number one choice for pontoon boat covers. Sherlass fabric is solution dyed, meaning the color, UV inhibitors, and stabilizers are actually a part of the fiber and cannot be separated, resulting in a fade resistant fabric which is a strong, long lasting fiber with rich color that will not wash out or transfer to your gel coat. A urethane coating is added to one side to provide additional stability, increase water and mildew resistance, and minimize shrinking and stretching. Sherlass fabric is available in multiple colors at Sayarite.com. Sherlass fabric has an outside surface and an inside surface. The side with the urethane coating is the underside. It is often darker in color. Here Angela is grabbing two of the panels and laying them so the outside surfaces are facing each other and all edges are lined up. Now she's applying double sided tape or seam stick. This is part number 129 to the long edge of the panel underneath. She'll peel off the transfer paper revealing the glue and now she'll base the panel on top so that the edges are lined up evenly. Seam stick is a major time saver, especially for those who are not professionals. You can base seams, hems, and patches to the fabric so it does not move around when you take it to the sewing machine to sew it. Sayerite highly recommends its double sided tape for canvas, which does not yellow and is just the right consistency for fabric sewing to hold panels and not gum up the needle much. It's now time to sew these two panels together. We will use a deluxe magnetic guide to keep our stitch about a half inch away from the raw edge of the fabric. We're using V92 polyester thread with a size number 20 needle. Our straight stitch length is set to about six millimeters. Sewing with a long straight stitch will help prevent puckering of the fabric. This type of seam we are sewing is called a semi-flat filled seam. Once the first stitch is in place along the length of the fabric, we will splay the fabric panels open so the outside surfaces are facing up. Then we will roll up the panel that will be fed under the arm of the sewing machine, exposing the seam. 
Now we will sew a top stitch which is about an eighth inch away from the fold being sure to catch the half inch flap of fabric on the bottom side as we sew. This illustration will show what we're doing in better detail. Notice that as Angela sews she's being careful to pull the fabric apart so the seam of the first stitch lays flat. She does this as she sews the top stitch. Also note that when she stops sewing she will typically bury her needle to the thickest part of the shaft. This makes it possible to rearrange the fabric around while still maintaining the last stitch position. Another good habit for sewing a semi-flat filled seam is to check to be sure the half inch flap on the bottom side is on the correct side so it is being sewn through when and every time that you stop to readjust the fabric. You can see her do this with her right arm going under the fabric to check for this. Let's take a look at the semi-flat filled seam from the top side and also the bottom side. Repeat this procedure for all of your pontoon boat covered panels until they are all sewn together. We have skipped ahead here and now we're showing all six panels all sewn together. Take the cover to the boat and drape it over the boat so it's centered. We will use pony clamps to hold it in place temporarily at the stern and the bow. As we cover the boat we will place support poles that are adjusted to the desired height in the appropriate positions we want along the cover. We will be using the boat vent too along with Sailrite's support poles. At this point the task at hand is only determining where each support pole should be positioned on the cover. Angela is doing this on her own, but a second helper would make this job much faster. Just center the cover on the boat and place the support poles where you want them, usually the center line of the boat and spaced evenly along the length. Angela is laying a tape measure down the center line of the boat. Since she has not spaced the support poles out evenly, she will use the tape measure to determine where the pole will actually be positioned on the fabric. Where she wants the pole, there she will mark the location on the underside of the fabric with a soapstone pencil. She's using the tape measure as her reference to where she wants the pole positioned so it's spaced evenly along the length of the boat. Do not worry about where the center is from port to starboard because we will determine that at the loft table by folding the fabric in half. Just be sure you have enough fabric at the aft and the bow to cover the snaps and still include for a double hem. Lay the cover on the floor and fold it in half to find the center. Be sure the outside surfaces are facing each other. Now find your marks that you made for each support pole and make a new mark at this new center location. Do that for all the support poles. Using some of the scrap fabric we will now make patch reinforcement circles for the boat vent locations. This will take some of the major abuse off the cover when the support pole is pushed up at that location. We will make the circles about 8 to 9 inches in diameter. Then we'll cut them out with scissors. We will use three patches at each boat vent location. So we're going to sew these three patches together first. This keeps them from moving around when it comes time to sew them in place on the cover. Angela cuts a rough sized circle in the center so she can position the patch on the underside of the cover over the mark she made earlier. If you're not using a boat vent but rather a grommet or a snap, do not cut a rough hole like this now. Before doing that she will use seam stick for canvas and place it around the perimeter of the patches. This will enable her to sew it without it moving around. She will feed the fabric under the arm of the sewing machine and twist the fabric clockwise before she even starts to sew. This makes it easier to sew around the circle patch in one easy step or pass. To sew this pontoon boat cover we're using the Sailrite Alterfeed LS1 sewing machine. 
This is a portable, heavy-duty walking foot sewing machine that is perfect for making boat covers like this and many other tasks. After building one boat cover like this, you will easily pay for the cost of the machine. You can get one from sayright.com. Notice that when Angela stops sewing, she will bury her needle to the thickest part of the shaft and then shifts the fabric around. In doing this, she prevents losing her spot while adjusting the fabric. And then when she gets to the end, she'll do some reversing just as she did at the beginning to lock the stitch in place. The crude hole we made earlier needs to be enlarged and also the cover itself needs to be cut. We want this hole to be large enough to fit the boat vent too. If you're using spur grommets, you would cut a hole the size of the spur grommet. If you're using a snap, you wouldn't cut a hole at all, you'd just install a snap. The boat vent too has a bar key on one side. It will need to be lined up with the bottom washer's slot. When they are matched up, the washers and umbrella slide together, mating perfectly. Position the lower washer under the cover, being sure the fabric does not cover the center raised circle of the washer. If it does, cut away more fabric. Take the upper portion of the vent and push it down through the washer. Then screw your wing nut on. The boat vent too and the cam lock support poles make a perfect combination for a boat cover like this. The cam lock support poles are superior to any thumb nut mooring pole. You can purchase them both from Sailrite. Now you can install the reinforcement patches and other boat vents as required for your boat cover in other locations. After all the support pole reinforcement patches and fence, if required, are installed, we will now need to position the fabric over the boat for patterning. To accomplish this task, Angela will use strapping tape and seam stick, which is placed over the snaps and along the sides of the boat. Here you see her using just the strapping tape and carefully running it over the path of the snaps, which have already been installed in our pontoon boat. If your boat does not have snaps installed, this tape should be placed where eventual snaps will be installed. Where this strapping tape is installed is where the doubled hem edge of the boat cover will stop. Now on top of the strapping tape she is using seam stick for canvas. If she were to just place the seam stick on the aluminum frame it would likely never come off easily. This will allow us to pull it off easily when we're done. Now reposition the cover onto the boat and install the support poles as you do so. Using pony clamps is a must to keep the cover in position and they will also be used to create our pattern darts which we will do in a later step. A second person is very helpful here. This pontoon boat has a bimini. We will need to remove it for proper patterning of the cover. Be sure the cover is centered from side to side. Just use a reference like a railing to ensure that the fabric edges fall in about the same spot on both the port and starboard sides. Keep using pony clamps to hold the fabric in place. Angela is going to check to be sure the vents look centered from above, and they do. Now that it is positioned roughly in the correct spot, she will remove the wax paper from the seam stick for canvas which reveals the glue on the double sided tape. Then Angela can start to baste the cover in place. Don't worry about making final pleats or darts in the cover yet but instead just go around the boat basting and get a general idea of where large darts will need to be placed as you base small portions in place. The job of creating final darts or pleats will be done once the total walk around is complete. The whole goal here is to create a tight fitting cover by removing the excess fabric to make it form fitting. To make it form fitting she will have to create darts or pleats, folds of fabric, which will take up the excess fabric. 
so she must determine where the best location is to create the dart. How is that done? Well, by trial. Just place the dart and see if you like it at that location. If not, move it to another location to see if it would possibly look better. The truth in the matter is, there are no rules for creating a dart at any location. Do what seems to work best for your boat cover. As she continues to walk around, pre-basting the cover in place, we will show this in double time. During this stage of patterning, she will move the pony clamps down so they are no longer above the snap line but below. It is still very important to use pony clamps. They will keep the cover from being pulled off an opposite side as it is being patterned since you will have to pull snugly to accomplish this task from the opposite side. Okay, it's now time to start securing the darts in place. Here at the stern corner you can see a very large amount of excess of fabric that has to be removed. To pattern this area, she will use a pony clamp and clamp the fabric in an attempt to remove the excess fabric for a better fit. This task will be duplicated any place on the cover where it's not fitting snugly. The pony clamps you see here along the bottom edge are only used to keep the cover in place. Those are not being used for darts. Generally, her job here is to create a rough dart anywhere one is required all around the sides of the cover. Then after all the required rough darts are secured in place with pony clamps, she will go back to each one and make final adjustments using either pony clamps or office clips. We'll show that a little bit later on in the video. We will be showing creating a few more darts in the cover. Then we will skip ahead to the final adjustment of the darts once they are all in place, which will result in a tight fitting cover. As you can see, she is creating a dart in the center here at the bow, so darts can go anywhere they are required. Also notice that she is using the seamstick basting tape, the double sided tape, that was affixed to the strapping tape to help hold the fabric along the edge of the boat as she creates the darts and pulls the fabric taut. You may notice that Angela did not include enough fabric here at the corner where the forward deck me meets the railing, but that's not too big of a deal. She would just have to create a triangular wedge which will be sewn in at that location in a later step. This is one nice fact of working with fabric. You can remove fabric or add fabric as needed. So we're going to ignore that for now and continue to pattern and create darts. Use the basting tape or seam stick you applied around the sides to aid in your patterning, as Angela is doing here. As you can see, if you don't like how it is stuck down, you can pull the fabric away from the seam stick and reapply it. Oh. 
At this location you can see the windshield is sticking up and that will require us to create darts or pleats along the sides at that location as well. Okay, let's move on to the point where all darts are roughly in place and now start to finalize each one with office clips. We're going to move ahead. We have skipped ahead to the point where all the darts are placed on the cover for a good fit. Now we will fine tune each dart with office clips prior to marking them. This step takes extra time but in the end will usually result in a more pleasing fitting cover. The large pony clamps can be rather heavy and may pull the fabric in an undesired way. Using these smaller clips will avoid that possibility. If the dart is rather large, leaving the pony clamp in place may be better than these smaller clips. We will continue to do this all around the cover where required. We're not going to show all of this. Where the bimini frame will protrude out of the cover, we need to cut slits to allow the cover to be pulled around the frame. At those locations, we will cut horizontally up into the cover to that location and then cut away any fabric that is on top of the mounting hardware. At these slit locations we will do either one of two things. We may opt to create a flap with velcro if the slit is rather large or we may just install binding and leave the slit open if snaps can secure it firmly in place. That means it needs to be rather small in size. For the one she is working on now we will create a fabric flap with velcro. The second position for mounting frame hardware will have a much smaller slit though it does not look like it in the video but much of the fabric will be cut away along the bottom edge here. At this slit we will not create a fabric flap but just use binding. Here at the aft, even though we have made darts and pleats in the fabric, we will be cutting away the fabric that hangs vertically. Why? Because we have a system here that looks better than creating all these small darts. We will show you that later on in the video. Here's a sneak peek. It's now time to use chalk or a pencil and mark the fabric. To begin with, mark where the bottom edge will stop. At this time we will not account for a double hem. That will be done once the cover is removed from the boat. The bottom edge of the rail that the snaps are installed in is a perfect guide for our pontoon boat. We're just running the chalk along the bottom edge of that rail. When Angela gets to a dart she will mark right around it being sure the chalk mark comes all the way to the folded point of the dart on both sides. Now she will follow the dart up and mark along the fold portion of the dart along this side and the opposite. In a future step these two lines will be used as a reference point where a straight stitch will be sewn to in effect remove that portion of the fabric from the cover. Notice that the dart goes up further past the rail, but at this point she can't reach the rest of it without a ladder, so she will move on and come back to it yet again to finish it off past the rail. Here is yet another okay. small dart. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you when it's done. At this location our cover edge takes a radical turn upwards. We have a few options. We can create a vertical upward turn or a gentle slanted edge here. Angela is feeling for the snaps now so she can determine which approach she wants to take. At first she decides to take that vertical upward turn. But then after marking the fabric she changes her mind and instead finds the two snaps that are catty corner to each other and marks the fabric with an angled edge upward. Which approach is better? I do not think it would have mattered which approach we took. So the choice is yours. Here she's also marking the fastener so she knows exactly where they'll be when she's patterning the fabric for that angled turn. 
more darts to mark. The process is exactly the same. Here you can see she marks where the dart will start or end. Just in case you want to pattern for the vertical fabric hanging down along the aft portion of the cover, we will still create our darts there. However, we will actually be cutting away the fabric right along the top edge of the rail and adding a vertical panel that hangs straight down there in a later step. Notice that if you make a mistake and mismark the fabric, it is easy to remove the chalk. We will skip ahead and show this completed here at the aft. Then we will move to the bow and show a large dart there. Angela had to crawl up onto the boat and hang over the edge so she can reach the top of this extra large dart. She marks it just as she did with any other dart that you've seen previously. Since they are so large, she simply strikes marks instead of one continuous line. She can join them when the fabric is laying flat on the floor in a later step. It's not a bad idea to mark where the snaps are along the edge. This does not mean we will install a snap at this particular location, but it does help us to ensure that the edge of the fabric is stopping in the correct location, just under the snap mark locations. Earlier we discussed not having enough fabric here at the deck. Now Angela will mark where the snaps fall at this spot and she also places an arrow here indicating that she needs more fabric. We will not worry about putting this in just yet, but later on it will be ready for a wedge triangle to be installed here. As you pattern, it is highly important to mark areas that may be prone to abrasion from sharp objects underneath the cover. We will be creating shafe resistant patches for those locations, so be sure to mark that all around the cover, any area that is prone to abrasion. Now we can remove the pony clamps that hold the cover onto the boat and remove the cover. It's not necessary to remove the clamps that are on the darts unless they are holding the cover to the boat. The cover should be laid on the floor so hem allowance and darts can be defined and or cut out. We are going to use a straight edge which is 2 inches in width and lay it up against the line we struck on the fabric indicating where the bottom edge would stop. This 2 inches of extra fabric will be used to make our double hem which will go all around the cover's edge. Here she is coming up to the location where the fabric takes an angled turn and she will continue to add the two inches for the hem along those lines also. This is the area where a triangular wedge will need to be inserted. We discussed that earlier. She will skip right over that part as she continues to add the two inches for the hem around the edge. Now we are coming up to a very large dart here at the bow. And you will notice that our edge line is missing. So we will trace for this line creating a gentle curb since we know this is an outer corner of the boat. Here at the bow we did not mark the edge as we did elsewhere. Instead we marked where each snap is located. So we will strike our two inch hem line below those snap positions as though a line were struck down at that location. We're now going to skip ahead to the stern section now. 
Here at the stern, we're going to cut away this fabric that hangs down vertically because we do not want to create darts here, but rather instead install a boxing or a facing type strip. So Angela is marking the beginning point with a straight line and then she will mark a half inch away a dotted line indicating where we will cut the fabric to include for a half inch seam allowance. If you prefer not to do this, you can just continue around adding the two inches and then create the darts here at the aft portion of the cover. But we think the cover looks best when this panel with darts is removed and a straight facing or boxing strip is sewn in its place. And notice that the line going from port to starboard side is not drawn all the way across. Angela will simply strike a line joining up the two that are on the opposite sides. Before we cut anything, let's turn our attention to the darts and cutouts for objects. Here she is working on a small dart. This dart was marked with just a few reference marks. She will now strike lines so she can easily follow them when the cover is taken over to be sewn. And here's where we made a cut vertically into the side of the cover to allow for Bimini mounting hardware to protrude out of the cover. We will simply cut an opening the width of the hardware on the boat. Ours is about two inches, so we will strike a line one inch from the slip we cut when we were patterning. Here is yet another small dart which is being traced around to be sure it is ready for sewing. When we get to a large dart, we will actually cut away the fabric making it easier to sew. How to do that is coming up. This pontoon boat cover has several large darts. This is one of them. Angela could not reach the very top of this dart when it was on the boat, so she will refold the dart and find where the peak of it will stop and then will trace down the marks joining them together. Follow this procedure for all the darts. Let's move on. Before she cuts away the fabric here at the aft, a measurement needs to be made to determine the correct size of the facing strip that needs to be cut. Here, she is getting a measurement of nine inches. Add two inches for a double hem and a half inch for seam allowance and we get 11 and a half inches. So we'll need to cut a facing strip that is 11 and a half inches wide. The length will be as long as the cover's fabric blank. We will have to shorten it when it comes time to sew it to the cover. Now we can cut away the fabric at the aft, cutting on top of the dotted line which is a half inch away from the line that indicated where the rail edge was. We're going to start here at the center and cut up. When that is done here at the aft, we can transition to the line we struck down indicating where the two inch double hem edge stops all around the cover. We're not going to show any more of that. Let's now turn our attention to the large or medium darts. We need to cut away the extra fabric in the center of each of the large to medium sized darts. To do this, cut a half inch inside the dart line. This leaves you with a half inch seam allowance. This makes the sewing of the large pleats or darts very easy. We have already completed much of the cutting away of the large darts and the vertical cutouts for the Bimini hardware. Here are some close-up shots of those areas. Notice that large to medium sized darts have the fabric cut away a half inch from the dart line. These darts are typically on the outside edge. However, smaller darts or darts that do not cross over the cover's edge 
do not have fabric cut away from the center of the dart. You could do that if you choose, but uh, we find it easier to leave the fabric in place for those. It's time to start sewing the cover again. We will first join the facing or boxing strip that we created for the aft portion of the cover. This strip hangs vertically directly on the edge of the stern rail. At the corner where we cut away the fabric for this, we need to cut a quarter inch slit in the very corner, which will allow us to make a 90 degree turn when we are sewing the strip to the cover. Outside surfaces must face each other when sewing this on. It looks like we may have made a slight measurement mistake because our facing strip is wider than the sides are. That's no problem. We can simply cut it down to size after it is sewn on to match the sides. Angela will match up the facing strip to the very corner where she made the slit. It should overlap at that location about a half inch, which is our seam allowance. We will use the Deluxe Magnetic Guide here and position it on the Ultrafeed LS1 so we can consistently sew about a half inch inside the edge. Now we start sewing, reversing at the beginning to lock the stitch in place with about a 6 millimeter long straight stitch lining up the edges of the fabric as it is being sewn. When we reach the corner we will do a little reversing and then bury our needle in the thickest part of the shaft. Lift the presser foot and rotate the fabric around. Then lower the foot and continue to sew down the other edge. The cover's fabric edge, the one on top, is not perfectly straight. It has some curve to it. So notice that when Angela sews it to the facing strip underneath, she is carefully lining up the curved edge with the facing edge as she sews them together. Since the facing strip is longer than it need be, we will stop sewing at the opposite corner and cut off the excess length before finishing sewing the st facing strip on. We are now looking at the outside surface and as you can see it's too long. So Angela will determine where it should be trimmed to size by lining it up. It's best to have extra here rather than too little. The extra can be trimmed in a later step. Too little? Well, it would be bad. She will also cut about a quarter inch at the corner on this side also. We are not going to show sewing this yet again, but instead we're going to skip ahead to the top stitch. We are creating a semi-flat felt seam here, so we will now sew a stitch about an eighth inch away from the fold, just as we did when we first sewed the panels of fabric together to make the cover. This is the outside surface facing up. When she gets to the corner where a turn needs to be made, again, the needle gets buried, the presser foot gets lifted, fabric gets turned, foot gets lowered, and continue to sew. Here's what it looks like when we are done sewing it on. Since it was evidently cut too wide, we will trim away the excess. We're going to use a ruler here and mark it to size, strike a line, and then cut it off. Next, we're going to concentrate on sewing up the darts. This is one of the many small darts which does not have the fabric cut out from the center. We will show you how to sew up one of these, and then after it's done, we'll show you how to sew up one of the larger darts with the fabric cut away. 
and notice that Angela finds the peak or the end of the dart, then folds the fabric over at that location with the outer surfaces facing each other. She will start sewing at that position, doing some reversing, and then she will carefully line up the lines so they are directly on top of each other, and sews right on top of them. True, you cannot see them because they are inside the fabric, but if you sew a few inches, then stop and check on the inside that they are lined up, and then continue sewing, it does work nicely. At the end of the dart, do some more reversing. Next, she will create a top stitch on the same dart. This time she is going to be sewing this on the outside surface of the fabric, about an eighth inch away from the previous stitch, just as we did with any other top stitch. Be sure to apply a slight pulling action against the first stitch so it is splayed apart well as you sew. It's also very important to reverse the beginning and end of your run. Here's what the bottom side looks like. Notice we sewed through the folded over portion of fabric when we created the top stitch. That's important. This cover has about six small darts like this one we just finished. We're not going to show any more of them. Instead we're going to move on and show sewing a large dart. Here is one of the large darts which had its fabric cut away from the center making it much easier to sew this one together. All Angela has to do is line up the cut edges of the dart and sew about a half inch away from the raw edges of the fabric, lining up the fabric as she sews. It's important to start at the peak of each one of these large darts. Here she stops sewing with the needle buried in the fabric. And she's being sure that the fabric will line up before she sews it all the way down the length of the dart. Then she continues to sew once she's confirmed that. Once that's done, she will splay the fabric open and sew a top stitch on the outside surface, being sure she catches the flap of fabric on the underside as she sews it. Do this just as you did with any previous top stitch. We're now going to skip ahead and show all the darts completed. We mark areas on the cover where chafe or abrasion may be an issue. Now we want to create chafe protection patches for each of those areas. These patches can be made from leftover fabric. We like to use at least two layers. These patches should be large enough to cover the area with about four to six inches all around. After we have cut it to size, we will sew the layers together, then apply the seam stick for canvas to the underside, and then baste it in position to the underside of the boat cover. Then we will sew around the perimeter of the patch, securing it to the pontoon boat cover. The next task is to install the double hem around the edges of the cover. In some places it may be difficult to make a double hem, like here where the canvas takes a number seven like turn. Almost all pontoon covers have one or two of these areas someplace on the cover. So what do you do? Well, just take a one inch polypropylene webbing and create a single hem with the webbing on top or sandwiched in between for those areas. 
In preparation for that, Angela is marking the fabric with the soapstone pencil at the one inch location from the edge where the webbing will be used instead of a double hem. Remember when we marked around the fabric two inches for our future double hem? Well, since it's difficult for that to be done here, we are removing one inch of that here. So we can use the webbing and a single hem. This can now be folded under to about one inch and the webbing can be used on the underside as reinforcement. We'll do that next. A slit needs to be made at the transitional corner so the fabric can fold nicely. This slit should be no more than one inch. Next, turn the fabric so the inside surface is facing up and start to sew the webbing on either the inside of the fold or on top of it, as shown in the video. She's going to go rather slow here at the turn, being sure the webbing and the hem will lay nicely when done being sewn. As she sews, she folds the fabric so it takes up about one inch, and she looks to be sure if snap locations have been marked, they are positioned at the correct distance from the edge. Since this area transitions to an area that will have a double hem installed, we will stop sewing the webbing about one or two inches from the edge so it will make it easier to install the double hem along the bottom edge of the cover. We'll cut off the excess with a hot knife. At the transitional area where the webbing and the single hem were created, we want the fabric to lay flat. To accomplish this task, cut a slit in the webbing, allowing it to relax at the turn. Do this with the hot knife. That makes a nice turn, but if we look at the outside surface of the fabric, a mark has been made indicating that a snap will fall right at this V. That area is no longer reinforced for a snap, so we will cut a small scrap of webbing with a hot knife and then sew it when we sew the opposite side of the webbing in place. That will reinforce the snap installation that will take place at this area in a later step. A side note, some covers are made with a two inch polypropylene webbing which is sandwiched in a single hem or sewn on an edge while binding is being installed around the whole edge of the cover. Some believe this is a time saver. The advantage of using a two inch webbing is the fact that the snap has more space to be installed along the edge. Since we are trying to save money, we are simply going to create a double hem along the edge, thus saving us from having to buy the two inch webbing and the one inch binding which would go all around the edge of the cover. To create our double hem all around the cover, we're going to use double sided tape or seam stick for canvas and baste the hem in place prior to sewing. This holds the fabric in place so it's much easier to sew the double hem. The first fold should be folded up about one inch, then she will install more seam stick for canvas along that folded edge and then fold it up about one inch also. Continue this process all around the cover's edge. After that's done, take it to the sewing machine and start sewing along the inside edge of the double hem, all around, using a straight stitch set to about 5 millimeters or 6 millimeters in length.
Remember that when we initially made the panels that make up the cover, we did not make the bow section panel wide enough to cover all the deck area near the gate. So Angela positions the cover on the boat and calculates where it will fall at that location for the added triangular section that needs to be sewn in there. She will mark on the fabric the general size and where the snaps fall. Then she will take some measurements from snap position to snap position, adding about 3 quarter inch extra so the snap will be installed in fabric and not just the panel's edge. So from each snap position she'll add 3 quarter of an inch and she'll write those measurements down on paper. This is the finished size. Here you can see from the middle of the snap to the next snap, we get about 19 inches. So she will add the 3 quarter inches to that to make it 19 and 3 quarter inches for that side. The cover is back at the loft table and we are working on that same area. Angela is marking the excess fabric here so it can be cut away. She needs to add a half inch here for the panel that will soon be created to fit that spot. That's for seam allowance. Let's take a sneak peek of the triangular panel after it has been installed on the boat. You can see that two of the sides have the double hem and one has seam allowance. So we need to add the correct amounts to the sides to accommodate for that. So from the measurements we took, we will add those amounts. She has laid the scrap fabric under the cover at the location and she strikes a line along the edge of the fabric here. And then she will measure the panel so it matches the finished sizes that we came up with while the cover was on the boat. After that's done, she will add the two inches for double hems and the half inch for the seam allowance. And notice that when the two inch is marked, she will hold the ruler perpendicular to the edge. The double hems are marked. Now she is marking for the half inch seam allowance. Then she will cut it out and base the hems. We'll not be showing all of that. Be sure when basting the hems that you baste them to the underside of the fabric. Before sewing all the hems in place, check to be sure that it is the correct size. If not, make modifications. Now sew the hems in place. After that's done, simply apply the seam stick for canvas to the seam line on the cover. Then baste it in place. It may be necessary to rip some of the stitches at the V-junction, otherwise you may not have enough fabric to sew it securely in place. Be sure the panel is basted so the outside surfaces are facing each other, as shown in the video. When joining panels like this, it is not unlikely to have a corner that will need to be trimmed away. We are trying to line up the hem edge, not the corners. Sew a stitch about a half inch away from the raw edges of the fabric. Then when that's done, sew a top stitch just as done elsewhere in this video. Now 
After it's all sewn here at the V junction, you will notice that we need to do some more sewing to strengthen this area. That is easily done. Anytime Angela needs to take a turn, she will bury the needle and pivot on it just as she's done elsewhere in the video. We will next concentrate on the opening slits that will allow the bimini frame to exit from the cover. Very small openings that do not go deeply into the cover may just need binding around the cutout, but larger ones that go down the sides by several inches should have a covering made to give it a finished look. Here we are going to show a larger opening slit and we are installing a binding on the edge using the Sayerite Swing Away 1 inch binder. When Angela comes to the corner where the opening takes a 90 degree turn, she will swing the binder out of the way and feed the binding on by hand at that location. When she gets past the two 90 degree turns, she will swing the binder back and continue to sew the rest on with the binder. The straight binder is by far our most popular binder. However, it does not do well with inside turns like this. For an application that has a lot of inside turns, you may want to consider the right angle binder from Sayerite. However, they will not typically feed heavier bindings like what is being used here. Now she has passed the turns, and before sewing the binding on the next leg, she will place a 2 inch wide velcro strip in place, so while the binding is being sewn down the edge, the velcro will also be sewn on at the same time. Then she will sew around the other three sides of the two inch velcro, securing it to the cover. Measure the width of the opening from binding edge to extreme velcro edge. Then measure the length or height of the velcro to the bottom edge of the cover. Cut a fabric flap from scrap fabric that size. Then cut the opposite side of the velcro. Here it's the loop side, the same length as the fabric flap. She will then place the velcro on the underside of the fabric and sew the binding around all four sides, catching the velcro's edge as the binding is being sewn on. Since the corners are a 90 degree turn, she will cut the binding at the corner and sew the opposite leg on so it covers the first binding. Use a hot knife to cut the last portion of the binding ends at each corner. This will seal the edge. Sew the unsewn side of the velcro to complete the flap. Now all we need to do is sew this flap onto the cover. It will be sewn obviously to allow the hardware to protrude from the cover and so it matches up with the velcro on the cover and the opening as it should be laying flat. If done appropriately it should be sewn directly on top of the binding. Our flap did not go all the way to the bottom edge of the cover. It could have if desired. Here is a small cutout for the hardware. We will simply sew binding around it and will not make a flap here. We will not be showing all of this as it is done exactly in the same way. 
All that's left now is to install the snaps. We have placed the cover on the pontoon boat and will now install the snaps. If you're replacing an old cover, you will often find snap studs that are missing or no longer have any threads in the metal or fiberglass to hold the snap or stud secure. If that's the case, Sailrite highly recommends using the Snaprite surface mount stud die to replace those snap studs. To use this die, install it in a standard riveting tool, and then use a standard snap stud and a Snaprite blind rivet. The Snaprite surface mount stud die holds the snap securely as you take it to the hole in your solid surface to install it. Now simply hold the die firmly against the surface and depress the lever a few times until the mandle breaks and your snap stud is installed securely in place. The Sailrite continuously receives phone calls asking about what to do about snap studs that no longer have a small enough hole for a screw stud. Well, the answer to those issues has been resolved with the Snaprite surface mount stud die, available exclusively at Sailrite. The snaps can be installed in the cover with a number of different tools. We've chosen to use the Sailrite Snaprite system. To use, place a mandrel through and a snap socket onto the socket die. Then snap the die onto the snap stud. Position the fabric over the mandrel and carefully push the mandrel through the fabric at the correct location. Now run the mandrel through the center of the snap right button and die. And while holding the die against the fabric firmly, depress the lever until the snap is installed securely in the fabric. The mandrel does not need to necessarily break. Snaps should be installed at the stern first, then after they are installed, the support poles should be positioned under the cover. The die can now be removed and used again. Now just snap the components together and you are done. Another advantage of using the Snaprite system is the fact that it can be used as a positioning device for each snap. Once the mandrel is pushed through the fabric, if you don't like its location, you can repunch it through the canvas at another location before installing the snap. If the snap stud is on a surface that does not allow the die to be snapped, like here on this rail which is concave in shape, that's no problem. Just use as normal, except do not snap it to the stud. Before installing snaps along the port, starboard, and bow, the support poles should be in place under the cover. Angela will install snaps at key areas first to hold the cover in the correct location before just working around the sides installing snaps one after the other. We're not going to show installing more snaps using the Snaprite system, but wanted to show another very popular snap installation tool that you may want to consider called the Press and Snap tool. This tool cannot be used to help position the snap, but it does install snaps very easily. Just locate the correct position for the snap and press the lever of the tool, and the hole for the snap's barrel is cut and the snap is set in just one squeeze of the lever. The Press and Snap tool is available at Sailrite. Our pontoon boat cover is now complete. Don't go away, coming up next is the materials list and the tools that we use to make this cover. If you're located in the tropics, you may want to consider using Sunbrella marine grade fabric as it will last longer in tropical conditions. If you have questions about what fabric to use, give us a call at Sailrite. Here are the quantities of the items we use to make this cover for our 24-foot pontoon boat. The material supplies, not including the tools, totaled about $450 for this cover. For more free videos like this, be sure to check out the Sailrite website or subscribe to the Sailrite YouTube channel today. It's your loyal patronage to Sailrite that makes these free videos available. Thanks for your loyal support. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sailrite, thanks for watching.